Concorde for 27 years was arguably the pinnacle of commercial aviation. The jet traveled at over 1,300 miles per hour and changed the perception of travel forever. The plane was able to fly from London to New York in around three hours. On a flight today, this would take eight hours. The plane was ultimately an incredible achievement, which unfortunately suffered many setbacks, which eventually led to its slow death. This video looks back at the development, operations and retirement of this iconic aircraft. Concorde emerged out of the desire and efforts of several countries from the 1950s to launch a supersonic commercial aircraft. Supersonic flight first took place in October 1947, with US Air Force pilot Chuck Yeager reaching a speed of Mach 1.06. With the pace of technological development, taking supersonic flight commercial was seen as the next step. Concorde was developed as part of an international treaty between the British and French governments. The name Concorde was chosen as the name of the project as the word was a synonym for agreement in both French and English. Concorde was built initially by British Aircraft Corporation, later to become BAE Systems, and French firm Sud Aviation, later Aerospatial. This would be jointly funded by both British and French governments. The final cost of development was $1.44 billion for each of the two countries, massively more than the original estimates. Concorde stands out for many as one of the top engineering successes of modern times. In many ways, it's a part of aviation technology that's been frozen since the 1960s, with no further interest in developing it further, until recently, that is. Here are just some of Concorde's standout features, which together gave it the performance and aerodynamic ability to reach Mach 2. The jet used four powerful Rolls-Royce Snecma Olympus 593 turbojet engines. These were developed initially by French manufacturer Snecma, as well as British manufacturer Bristol Sidley engines, which was acquired by Rolls-Royce during development. Initial designs looked at turbofan engines, but these were rejected as the larger size caused too much drag. Reheat or afterburner technology was added and was critical to reaching high speeds and was used by Concorde on takeoff and between Mach 0.95 and Mach 1.7. One of the challenges of supersonic flight is the drag created at such high speeds. The solution was a delta wing that was an instantly recognizable feature of Concorde. This used a small span swept back and thin design to increase lift at high angles of attack. The jet also had a sharp pointed nose that maximized aerodynamics. However, its length posed a visibility problem during takeoff and landing. Thus, a hinged design allowed the nose to be dropped for takeoff and landing. There were originally two versions of Concorde planned a long-range and a short-range version. However, there was little interest in the short-range aircraft, which was ultimately dropped due to lack of orders. The 1960s excitement and potential of supersonic transport is perhaps best shown by the orders received. While only two airlines would end up taking delivery of the jet, Concorde initially had around 100 options from 18 airlines. Concorde entered service in January 1976 with British Airways and Air France. Each of the two airlines went on to take delivery of seven aircraft, with six more built as prototypes and test aircraft. A simultaneous takeoff for the first commercial flights was arranged, with British Airways flying from London Heathrow to Bahrain and Air France to Rio de Janeiro via Senegal. New York is the most remembered Concorde destination, and for good reason. Both British Airways and Air France operated regular New York services. This has always been a key profit-generating transatlantic route. Concorde was unfortunately unable to fly supersonic further overland, largely due to noise concerns. This would ultimately heavily restrict the jet's routes and its viability. Other important BA routes included London to Bahrain, which was BA's first Concorde destination in 1976. London to Washington Dulles Airport. This was the first US airport served until New York lifted noise restrictions in 1977. It remained a destination until 1994. Miami was also added between 1984 and 1991. Barbados was a seasonal service from 1987 until retirement in 2003. 
Air France operated Rio de Janeiro via Dakar. This was Air France's first service in 1976. The airline also flew various South American destinations, usually coinciding with boom periods in the 1970s and 1980s, including Caracas and Mexico City. Like British Airways, it also served Washington Dulles until 1982. Concorde was also flown in collaboration with a few other airlines. There were also plenty of charters that took Concorde to many locations, with British Airways operating around 300 charters each year. Concorde had two main airline collaborations. One was a joint service with Singapore Airlines and British Airways from London to Singapore via Bahrain between 1977 and 1980. Another was Braniff International Airways operating the jet subsonic between Dallas and Washington Dulles. This ran with both BA and Air France aircraft from 1978 to 1980, but ultimately was not profitable. Flying on the jet wasn't cheap. In 1977, the one-way fare from London to Washington was £431. Converting currency and adjusting for inflation, that's about $3,400 today. Fares increased as times went on. By the late 1990s, the one-way transatlantic fare was around $6,000. With significant improvements in subsonic business and first-class comfort around the same time, it became harder to sell. With only British Airways and Air France confirming orders and taking delivery, the aircraft's quote-unquote fall somewhat took place even before it entered service. Let's go back to before it entered service to see what happened. The numerous cancellations of options were due to a number of factors. First was the increasing cost of the project. A lot of work goes into developing a new aircraft. The cost and complexity is multiplied when pursuing a brand new supersonic jet from scratch. There were a lot of unknowns for airlines, which included operating costs and returns. This uncertainty increased when estimated aircraft costs continued to rise. The New York Times explained that by 1973, the estimated cost per aircraft had risen from under $20 million to $46 million, and many expected it to increase to $60 million. If you're liking this video so far, why not click subscribe and hit the like button? Oh, and be sure to click that notification bell too. The crash of the Russian Tu-144 in 1973, whilst demonstrating at the Paris Air Show, was another factor that brought down airline confidence in supersonic passenger travel. Additionally, the cancellation of the Boeing 2707 added to more uncertainty about supersonic development and costs. This competing project was cancelled in 1971, and, despite having more orders, its cancellation raised more concerns over Concorde's viability. Noise impact was always known to be a problem with supersonic aircraft, but concerns grew as the project progressed. A potential government-imposed limitation to only operate over water was too much of a restriction for some airlines. For the two airlines that were committed to operating Concorde, three main factors come to mind when looking at the aircraft's downfall. When Concorde was designed, fuel prices were low. However, the oil crisis of 1973 to 1974 sent prices up, hurting the economics of operating it. The sonic boom issues continued as well. Overland operations remained restricted due to the noise, and as such, it was essentially restricted to transatlantic routes. Finally, we can't discuss the jet's demise without looking at its safety record. The crash of Air France Flight 4590 in July 2000 killed all 109 passengers and crew on board. There may have been just this one crash in its history, but it was a significant disaster that severely damaged the jet's reputation. In the end, Concorde was retired in 2003. British Airways and Air France jointly announced this in April of that year. Air France flew its last commercial flight in June, with British Airways operating it until October. When Concorde retired, it had been in service for 27 years. For most aircraft, this age retirement would be nearing. Certainly, to keep existing aircraft operating would become increasingly expensive. After retirement, most aircraft headed to storage and display. There was an attempt from Virgin Atlantic's Richard Branson to buy them. 
Unfortunately, this never proceeded, despite an appeal to the UK government to step in. The jets are now featured in museums across the world, including locations in UK, France, the United States, Germany, and even in Barbados. Almost 20 years after Concorde's last flight, the situation is once again looking promising for supersonic passenger flight, with several companies working on commercial jets large and small. Today's manufacturers have addressed the problems with Concorde's high operating costs and lack of efficiency. Some manufacturers have even put extra effort into reducing the noise of their aircraft's sonic boom. Concorde will always be remembered as the first supersonic passenger jet to operate regularly scheduled passenger service to multiple markets, doing so for nearly three decades. Commercial supersonic travel is set to experience a revival in the next decade, made possible with a trailblazed by Concorde. Do you think we'll ever see a supersonic jet as large as the Concorde in the future? Let us know in the comments. Did you know that we publish over 175 stories every single week on simpleflying.com? Be sure to check the link in the description for more great stories just like this. Thanks for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe before you go.